Very excited to have Mr. Dan Christian on episode number 56 of the Path to Fall podcast. Um, last week, my sister and my mom were driving out west. My sister's in the military, and she's she was in the process of moving to Seattle, Tacoma area for her uh, her five-year military service out in Fort Lewis. And my mom and my sister, they stopped in Chicago. They were continuing to drive. The next day, I, I get a family group text and my mom goes i just ran into dan christian and i was like what what in the world dan christian and just an unbelievable coincidence uh, yeah. dan you're you're in the coffee shop hanging out d reading some dante and wearing a gilman sweatshirt <laughs> so that's the story and then the week later we're we're connected on the podcast here we go. So cross pollination is uh, is still alive and well. So, so thanks so much for doing this, Dan. I'm excited to talk to you about everything that you've done for Gilman and your interest in Dante and wherever the conversation takes us. Um, I had a I had an English teacher in high school and we read Dante's Inferno, and that's really that was really a memorable experience for me. She was kind of an older lady, uh, Miss Shepard, and she was one of my all-time favorite English teachers and really one of the reasons that I started to seriously pursue English. And right. it wasn't really until a couple nights ago that I dove back into Dante and watched some of your old lectures and some lectures I found on YouTube. So I'm excited to to pick your brain a little bit about, about okay. Dante. Absolutely. How did you first become interested in, in Dante? Where did that start? Well, I mean, it turned out to be in terms of that Gilman. I, um, when I came to Gilman in 1980, uh, I was part-time. And then I realized I hadn't borrowed enough money. Um, and so I realized I was going to have to, you know, I was going to work. I was going to get my master's degree in theology at St. Mary's right across the street. And I was going to then move back to the Midwest where I had, uh, you know, taught and coached until I, uh, mostly until I got there. And uh, my mom died suddenly on Christmas Eve, 1980. And I realized that um, during that summer, I realized, so I walked across the street. I, I'd heard that they needed a part-time religion teacher. So I walked across the street, applied. Um, I mean, to be honest, I, you know, I'm pretty sure they hired me because they were desperate because it was the, like about the end of June and they didn't have a, didn't have anybody to fill that slot. So uh, I did, I worked part-time at Gilman and then I worked at the Enoch Pratt library as a page uh, for that entire year. And it was a great job. I mean, so I kind of went to, taught at Gilman in the morning, caught the bus, went downtown, worked in the afternoon and then came back to Gilman and was a freshman basketball coach and then a sort of an assistant track coach that year. But then when my mother died, I decided I didn't want to move back, but I didn't have a full-time job and I really had no idea what I was going to do. So Sherman Bristow, uh, athletic director, Mrs. Bristow, Lori's uh, husband, uh, he told Reddy Finney, along with Jerry Downs, who was the uh, English department chair then, um, that I could teach English because they needed two sections of ninth grade English for the next year. And so they hired me as a part-time, as a religion teacher and an English teacher. I got to be a full-time teacher. And what they did not realize then, because I didn't tell them, um, is that I had only read about four novels my entire life. <laughs> and so that summer, getting ready for ninth grade English, I um, got to, I started reading books, right? Because, you know, you got to get ready for school. And as hokey as it might sound, the whole world of books opened up. I mean, I felt like Dorothy coming out of the house from black and white to color. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, I had, you know, I, I, I mean, what an opportunity, right? I mean, the whole, literally the whole world of books opened up. And uh, so I got to be an English teacher for 38 of my 39 years at Gilman. And so I, on some fundamental level, uh, I couldn't thank Gilman I mean, it's like a huge chance on me, right? I mean, I had no clue. And then, you know, the uh, the Cooper fellow, you know, yep. so Michael Cooper uh, was the first, was in my first ninth grade English class. And he died that first week in that accident. And he wrote his assignment and I gave this to his mom and dad after the funeral. 
the first writing assignment I gave the kids was they had to uh, recommend themselves for a summer job. So he recommended himself and here, you know, I can do, he was going to apply for a summer camp counselor, to, you know, a CET thing or CIT. And he said, you know, I can do this and this, but my strongest attributes as a counselor is I don't cuss and I don't spit. <laughs> those were his, rec those were his strengths. So, um, so he was in my first, so it was a terrible, I mean, that first year to have a student die, you know, but, um, so I remember that first year very specially, but so the next year I took a course in Dante at the seminary and I loved it by father, Joseph Gallagher. And it was so interesting. And Gilman, if you can imagine the logistics of this, Gilman was on trimesters then. Mm -hmm. And then in a few years after that, the English department stayed on trimesters for one year, but the rest of the school was on semesters. I mean, you know, I mean, it was just a wild thing. But I, what you could kind of do then is I went to Mr. Downs, the English department chair, and could I offer an elective on Dante? Because I thought it was really cool, you know, and absolutely, you know, next year I teach a course on Dante. It was kind of like that quick. And so uh, one semester in 1982, offered a course on Dante. There were four kids in it. Um, Matt Atkinson, Geno Freeman, Van Smith, and I wish I could remember the fourth. I, my, I, I used to be able to remember all of them, and now I've gone blank. And then uh, we did it 30, 30, 70 years in a row. What was it about that first class that you took at the seminary about the divine comedy that really attracted you, enticed you, made you want to teach a senior elective on the divine comedy? You know, that that's a really great question, right? Because it, you know, there's a certain, because you can probably think of, you know, as, as a young teacher now too, you know, where there are some books that just touch a part of us that we may not have even known existed before. And um, Joseph, Father Gallagher was terrific. And, um, I still remember, I literally remember, we read John Sinclair's translation. And in the first canto of Inferno, Dante is telling, talking about what the time is of the day after he gets um, you know, confronted by these three beasts. And he says, the time was the beginning of the morning and the sun was mounting with those stars that were with it when divine love first set in motion those fair things so that the hour of the day and the sweet season moved me to good hope. And it literally attached itself in my memory like it was literary Velcro, <laughs> you know, it, like it just, it attached. And I thought, okay, you know, like, it's like watching Michael Jordan, you know, uh, spin dribble and, you know, knock a 20 footer down. It's like, who does things like that? And so, so Dante said things like that. And so th that, that part of me that was touched by a, literally a powerful moment in the story like that, that just wanted to become a part of me in a way that I didn't even know that part could be touched. I thought, okay, maybe the kids would find this interesting, you know, because I mean, you try one of the nice things certainly about Gilman and certainly when I was, got to begin this process is, you know, obviously you want to teach the kids what they or offer the kids an opportunity to think about things that matter, but also you got to, and what matters hopefully is what you love, right? That would be the nice combo, right? Is that, and um, so if you offer the kids things that you think are worthy of care and hopefully every kid isn't going to buy in. Um, but there, that was pretty much that one line from Dante's Inferno. Uh, and then also I learned that, in, you know, most people think of Dante, they think of him as the poet of hell. And that's only one third of the journey. Mm -hmm. You know, most of the story is moving towards the light. And, you know, some people say, you know, I've heard people say, you know, well, it's better to light one candle than to curse the darkness. And my response to that was reading you read Inferno is, it's better to identify the nature of the darkness first before you go around randomly striking matches, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> because you could really you could cause some explosive situations. So, so that was kind of it. It was, it was a great opportunity and had some wonderful kids sign up. Uh, Matt Atkinson was on, um, uh, Gino Freeman was on a freshman basketball team. And Matt was on my first varsity basketball team when I coached varsity for that one season. So that, that teacher coach model, which is not unique to Gilman. I mean, my high school 
coaches were my math teachers, right? I mean, and, and those things existed, but th there was such a special opportunity to go from, okay, take out your notebooks to get in your defensive stance. Right. You know, that was a nice combo because you could connect sometimes, you know, with Dante oftentimes don't move chaotically like the people in hell do move purposely like the people in purgatory do and ultimately celebratory in a way. So, so it always often tended to connect because things that matter often to do connect. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so many questions are, are popping up into my mind, but one thing that I was thinking about is I read Dante's Inferno, as I said, in high school in that English class. And I feel like that's pretty common that students read only one of the, th the three epic poems, right? Or that yep. one part of the entire divine comedy. Why is yep. that? Why and why is it important in your mind to read some of all three or all three of, of the divine comedy? That's a, that is a that's a great question. Um, C.S. Lewis said once in a book talking about a teacher he had was that um, t having this teacher was like it gave him a chance to acquire intellectual muscle. So when you read Dante, it's like you're pumping epic poetry, you know, and, and um, kind of cool. But um, because thematically, the journey or the episodically, the journey goes from darkness to light, but in a kind of cosmological way, because in Dante's world, um, the light is ultimate reality and darkness is the twisting of that light. So the only way to really, truly understand the nature of the twisting is to get to the light and look back and see what, how the, the ultimate reality has been perverted. So if you only stay in hell, uh, then you, even if like, we used to give the kids a copy of Alcoholics Anonymous, the 12 steps, and to think of, because you don't have to be a, a, an addict to be in recovery. And um, what ends up all we often happening, like for the recovering addict, when he gets to the Dante gets to the bottom of hell, is like an addict who is no longer drinking, but has not yet learned what it means to live a sober life. So he or she is white knuckling it, right? And so it's not about not drinking, although not drinking is certainly critical to recovery. It's living well soberly is the highest way to thrive, right? For the, for the human being. And we all want to learn how to thrive. So you got to experience the whole journey and get a sense of what is the big light in order to see the process more clearly. Hmm. But Paradiso is hard. You know, I mean, it's a difficult thing. And you know, what I used to tell the kids, because it was true, because obviously you try not to tell kids stuff that, that's not true, is that Dante's story is a real teacher. I just read the papers on his behalf. You know, that I'm sort of Dante's T TA, you know? <laughs> and be because we are reading this together. And obviously I'm a more experienced fellow pilgrim on the road, but it's not like I'm gonna teach Dante, it's like sort of ridiculous. But I can certainly read with these kids. And, and some, kid, some kids used to say, how can you do this 37 years in a row? Doesn't it get old? Well, number one, it doesn't get old. I'm brand new each year because I'm a year older. And number two, I have never read this with this particular group of kids before. So it's brand new. I mean, it's brand new each time. So, um, so I, got to, I got to read Dante with some pretty wonderful kids who – signed up right that's a nice thing about the system gilman has is certainly the senior elective program is still in effect and um you know one of the good things that certainly patrick hastings has been a point person for and an advocate for done a really good job of broadening the reading experience right for the kids in terms of the department and that's just you know i mean that was a, a good thing he did uh, and was a point person for uh because we talked a lot about it, but never got to it. Um, and so now they read lots of things as well as older things, you know, they kind of uh, combine stuff. But I mean, I get to read a, a story with kids that signed up. Um, 
I mean, it doesn't get a whole, because every kid, you know, you hate having kids miss class, right? Because that kid has a unique kit, a unique key into a particular door into that story. And if that kid isn't there in class, all of us lose because we don't get to look in that unique door. Mm. Um, so anyway, kind of rambling there. Sorry, but that's the, that was the, uh, um, I, that's why I think that you got to go to heaven, um, in order to, uh, understand the whole better. And if you don't, you, you, um, impede your progress and you get sort of stuck in the negative as opposed to the positive. And this question probably cannot be answered in a simplified answer, but what exactly is it that you find out what is revealed to you when you get to paradise about the entire divine comedy, or is that something that you have to experience by reading the whole thing? Well, um, my response to that, cause I, I'm learning now again, I'm a thousand years old and I, I think I learned, I started learning this because I got to be an English teacher. Like I don't have any answers to any questions. I have responses to questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I don't really have any answers, you know, th that, um, you know, that great line by Rilke, right? You know, don't worry so much about the answers, learn how to live the questions. And so Sam Keen, my favorite authors of all time, says he creatively misspells the word question as the quest I'm on, hmm. which is a really, a, a really nice thing. I, you know, number one, I think both. I think, I think you as a young man, young reader, young teacher, um, um, just like your students, we're all on our, the key phrase and the first line of Dante's Inferno is midway in the journey of our life, Nostra Vita. Um, I came to myself in a dark wood and the straight way was lost. So he leads with the us and then proceeds to tell his story. So um, you have to make your own journey alone, but you don't have to do it by yourself. Thus, that's where we come in. That's where your friends and family and, and students come in, too. And I think it's a great question. What Dante finds is he finds what Harry Chapin says in this 16-minute long um, sort of modern-day version of Don McLean's American Pie, um, but it's not five minutes long, it's 15 minutes long. He learns that the journey is worthwhile. That's what he learns and and how you how we uh, incorporate that value is what the journey is about that um life getting to be a human being and getting to be here it's a journey even the word journey has the word our in it mm. right so um i think that's what he learns at the end of the day that that when he said the passage that i you know got surgically implanted into my head and heart about you know the love uh, movement, right? The, the prime mover, Aristotle's phrase, right? The last line of Paradiso is Dante gets a glimpse of the love that moves the sun and the other stars. So I think he learns that, that love is, is the begin the be all and end all, you know, but learning how to love well, welcome to the journey. You know, I mean, that's quite a challenge, right? That's not <laughs> a, that's an essay question. That's not a fill in the blank question. Hmm. For sure. So. so, so was your was your Dante class typically structured around conversation with all of the students, or was it you kind of lecturing on what you found out about Dante? And the other part of this question is, so a lot of people will say you taught a class on on Dante for for a long time here at Gilman. How did you make something that was written in 1300s relevant to like 15, 16 year old boys who continued to teach you about something that you were obsessed by and, and read a lot on your own and were really a, a, a master of? How did they teach you about such a subject that you were already passionate about and already knew so much about? That, that's a really, I mean, again, that's a great question. The quest I'm on, you know, I, um, I stopped trying, I stopped using the phrase that I taught a course on Dante uh, and tried to use the term that I offered a course on Dante. Uh, because back to the thing, you know, we, Dante's story was the real teacher. And, um, and, and I'm sure that you're learning too, as, uh, as you move through your own 
journey of being a, a, a school reader with students, right? That um, when, not every day, because they're young people, but I mean, I'm, you know, 67 and I'm still, you know, trying to show up for life every day. But I think these kids, our Gilman kids, Bryn Mawr, Roland Park, but I've, I've met a number of young students. I've worked with some basketball kids at a public high school out here in my first year and not last year. I think people and young people in general that are are pretty hungry to to think hard about what their lives mean. You know, I think they're pretty hungry and I think they are genuinely hungry, even though they may not be because they're adolescents and peer pressure and stuff. You know, they may not want to go public with their longing for meaning yet, uh, but that's OK. I mean, there's peer pressure among adults. You know, you, you've been in faculty meetings. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's yep. lots of peer pressure, you know, sure. to think that somehow the kids are just, you know, we don't want somebody to think, you know, and therefore sometimes adults sit on their hands just like kids do. Um, but so and then I mean, think about some of your colleagues. You know, I thought about this before. I mean, um, Matt Baum, right, who, you know, uh, Alex DeWeese, um, Russell Wren. Uh, Kate Guyton in the lower school, they were all, I got to read Dante with them. And so here they are, you know, fellow colleagues of yours and colleagues of mine before I left. I mean, Matt, I was his basketball coach. He was, uh, and I was, he was in my ninth grade English class and then our Dante class. Then he went to college. He got married. He named his first daughter Beatrice. And, um, and now he's head of the history department and we got to share the bench together for three years. Now, if that isn't a sign that the journey is worthwhile, I don't know what is. For it to come full circle, and that's what Dante's entire story is about, is honoring the, the circle. Harry Chapin's family anthem is All My Life's a Circle. So, uh, you know, Russell Wren, you know, Alex DeWeese, you know, is one of the finest young men that I've ever met. Um, and I got to hang out with Dante with those kids and then to get to share faculty meetings with them down the road at, you know, at another stage in, in their journey and my journey. Um, so I think Dante and, and certainly Patrick Hastings is aware of this too, in his wonderful course on Ulysses and, you know, Timmy Holly and the African-American literature course that he taught. I mean, Patrick knows, cause he and I've had some wonderful conversations. I mean, over the years that Ulysses, how do you make Ulysses relevant? You invite people to read it, and its intrinsic relevance will shout to the heavens, here I am. You know, I mean, Ulysses is an unbelievably difficult book, but because you, but because Patrick Hastings and Timmy Holly are moved by the love that moves the sun and the other stars towards that particular text, all of a sudden it's intrinsic value. You don't have to, you don't have to sell Dante or even get kids to buy in. You just have to bear witness to its value and invite them to come along. And then you've done your job. If they come along, great. I mean, they're, they're responsible for their own education on some level, right? I mean, because they are, they have personal agency. Mm -hmm. So bear witness to value. And I think you're going to, I think we are doing the best we can to do the best we can. And I always, I always think about that other part of when I first started teaching a couple of years ago, I, I had read the books before and I studied English in college and I felt like, what is, what is a 15, 16 year old in my class going to teach me about something that I've read and studied and prepared to teach them? And now in my third year, I've really realized how much that I learn every day from the kids in my class and from the things that they say and the things that they write. And it's just a brand new perspective on something that I felt that I had already known really well or knew enough about. And that's just never, never the case. And when you say that, you know, in your 38 years of teaching at Gilman that, you know, like how could you do that and not get boring? It never really gets boring when it's conversational or you're learning from the, the students in your class. That's very, very well said. And I, you know, I mean, I got to teach at a few other schools. I mean, I got to teach at Gilman for 39. I got to teach for 43 years total. And, um, and what you just said there, you know, and maybe Cesare can facilitate that, particularly since you're just sort of starting out in, in this, you know, educational sort of journey. 
um, you know, the Gilman, Gilman talks a lot about the Gilman Five, and, and those are complicated things. They're not just, you know, putting them on a poster is not the end of that discussion, right? I mean, those things are really, are really tough. And I'd, I'd always hope that when the Gilman Five went public and they have a definition of humility, I think is um, something like never draw attention to your own successes, but always draw attention to the successes of others. I, I kind of bristled with that uh, definition, because, particularly when they actually put it on a poster above the door to the gym. So you literally walked through these huge trophy cases, and then you read a definition that said, don't draw attention to your own successes. You know, <laughs> well, we just walk through a trophy case that draws huge <laughs> attention. But what you just said about there, after three years, you realize you thought you knew, but then now after reading with these kids, you realize how much you still can learn, you know, maybe Cesare can sort of transcribe that, you know, Jake Scott young teacher statement and put that <laughs> as the definition of humility, you know, because I think that approaches because humility is going to be an elusive value that's beyond language, right? I mean, you can never nail it down, but you did a really good job there. Um, uh, re, I had a wonderful kid in 2016, Kevin Walker, who came up with this phrase. Uh, Harold Bloom has this phrase about creative misreading. I read this book, The Anxiety of Influence, that I may have understood maybe six words in the entire book. But um, Kevin, I gave them that phrase, creative misreading, and Kevin talked about, came up with this phrase, creative repurposing. And you creatively repurpose right there very nicely the struggle to define humility in a meaningful way. And so that's a great thing. I hope you hang on to that. Um, uh, I had a, a colleague, Bruce Daniels, when I first came to Gilman, he was the quirkiest human being on earth. He was an older man when I came and he sat around the corner where my desk was my first English year. And he was quirky. I mean, he would, when I'd walk in, he'd always call me brother Christian. You know, I mean, he was just, hey, brother D, you know, he was just, I mean, he was just the dearest man. And I used to eavesdrop when he was talking with kids about uh, books because I, I didn't want to make him, un you know, and it was literally while he was there for nine years, when I was there, it was a literary appreciation course because, um, and when he retired in 1989 in January, we were in the English offices together at that time, and it's hard to describe where that was in the new remodeled Cary Hall. But um, Bruce came into me and he gave me um, a folder of poems. And he said, Brother Christian, I want you to have these. And I said, okay, well, thank you. Because these were poems, some poems Mr. Daniels had written, some poems that students had written. He offered a lyric poetry class. And um, I said, oh, well, thank you. And so he sat down. Again, very quirky guy. He was a great tennis player. He's a really good athlete in Amherst, but quirky off the charts. But dear, and, and he said, can I read you one of these poems? I said, absolutely. And nobody's around, right? So, you know, the best thing about Mr. Daniels, what was so impressive about him, was he never tried to be impressive. He was just himself. And he reads a poem, and it's by a, a former student of his back in the late 60s, I think. And... Um, He's reading it. So I'm sitting there and I got my eyes closed and I'm listening to him read this poem. And I look up and he has tears just running down his face. And he then pauses as he gets to the end of the poem. And he says, Brother Christian, I'm so sorry. I've never been able to read this poem dry eyed. So I literally knew, and again, 1989, right? I mean, I'm what, 34 years old, maybe 35. And I realized if I could have that kind of love for literature at the end of my time, as Mr. Daniels did, then I would, and I hope, because I never forgot that moment, and I hoped every time I went into the classroom that I did honor, I honored that moment with Mr. Daniels by trying to go in and talk about books with kids. If that makes sense? Yeah, for sure. I so it was, it was pretty neat. So it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and it didn't, and it doesn't seem like your love for literature really started up till later, until you really started teaching at Gilman. And I'm curious, maybe 
why it didn't why it didn't really spark for you earlier on or, or what really sparked it when you started teaching English at Gilman and you took that class at the seminary on Dante and really decided you wanted to teach or, or what was it about that experience that sparked your love for literature because you're so you're so passionate about it I'm curious why it didn't happen earlier for you well I mean I you know I came to realize that, that books sort of and Dante in particular I guess but certainly books in general have become kind of a source of supplemental oxygen for me, you know, that, um, and I, you know, when I was in high school, I mean, and I'm not proud of this in any way, shape or form. I mean, my, you know, my parents, you know, were, you know, lower middle-class working class folks, you know, my dad was a mailman. My mom was a telephone operator. First, I was the first person in my family to get to go to college. And I wanted to go to college because I wanted to play college basketball. And uh, the coach said I was recruited by no one and like zero. And I showed a, a film to a college coach here in Davenport, Iowa, and of the best game I had my senior year. And our team had a great game. And he looked at it and he said, hey, thanks for coming, Dan. You're more than welcome if you get accepted at Ambrose to come out for the team. But I've been coaching a long time. In my opinion, you cannot play college basketball anywhere. You can shoot a little, but you can't dribble. You're not very fast. You can't, I mean, all the can'ts and all those were true. I tried hard. And so I went to St. Ambrose because I thought I could play. And I was fortunate enough to try out and earn a scholarship and play for four years and got to start my senior year and all that sort of stuff. But reading books was never literature, was just never something that I was on my personal radar. And I became a theology major and a history major. I double majored in history and theology. And I just sort of made it through English classes by, again, I would, you know, again, by what, what do I say? I mean, I was, I was a narrow-minded idiot, essentially, you know, for lack of a better phrase. I didn't pay attention. Um, and then, again, I got to become an English teacher at a time when I was 26. And by surprise, and I was sort of forced by my job to open up these books. And you know that old line, you know, that um, when the student is ready, um, the teacher appears. Mm -hmm. And a kid, literally, um, um, Ryan Rizzuto, in my ninth grade English class, who is Ellen Rizzuto's son in the lower school. He was in my ninth grade class, and I had both the daughters in our Dante class as well. And Ryan said, well, maybe, Mr. Christian, you, we should think about it as when the student is ready, the book appears. Had a boy, you know, I mean, that's right. Exactly. There we go. And so that really rang true. And yeah. so those kind of things you learn from kids. So I was focused on, I wanted to play college basketball and I was lucky enough to get to do that. And then um, I taught religion, you know, again, at different schools and coached basketball. And then I landed at Gilman literally by accident or the benevolence of the universe. And then um, Sherm Bristow told Mr. Finney, I think Dan can teach English. And so I did my very best to honor that unexpected opportunity. And I hope I, I hope just like, you know, they say on the golf courses, right? Make sure that when you leave the golf course, you try to leave the course in better shape than you found it. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope in some, some way that, that Gilman as a school and certainly the lives of some young people, I hope their lives were better by, by having conversations about books with me i hope i hope that was to their benefit it was certainly to my benefit well i i know that's the case from how much i've heard of you and i came in your last year here and i felt like we didn't really get to know each other that well because i was trying to get acclimated to gilman and right. you know we just didn't cross paths too much but so many people who have come on the podcast and who i've talked to this year really have said you have to get dan christian on the podcast because he really changed you know, the, the, the life, the student life at Gilman as a, as a teacher and that Dante course is, you know, Russell Wren was on here talking about how impactful that was for him and, you know, Matt Baum and, and so many other people. So I, I know that for sure. Well, I, I, I appreciate that. You know, I mean, uh, you know, uh, Sam Keen, who we brought, I mean, I got to bring invite as the Mount Castle lecturer in 1996 uh, when that was a role that I that I tried my best to on, and um, he says in one of, a book that I reread twice a year, he says, "If you were mortal, what would you do today?" 
and there's always a you know a gap where you got oh yeah i forgot i am mortal <laughs> you know holy cow you know i wasn't you know thanks for reminding me you know and so um and you mentioned the, you know i mean russell and certainly and matt and, and alex and, and will bartz and certainly timmy holly my dear friend and tony jordan i mean i you know i can't really list the feats the, the people without you know leaving somebody uh somebody out that hasn't um um has has it didn't ultimately and i learned so much actually like i said that i mean i know that i i guess there's probably get about sounding cynical or something you know the value of sitting in other people's classes and i know there's more and more of a push to that i used to just sometimes wander the halls and just stand outside people's classrooms um and i you know uh i listened to timmy holly and i used to share an office space where he was behind a door and uh when we had just met him mean, he and i've been friends since 1985 and i listened to timmy with the door shut talking to jimmy fields who was a really good player back in the uh, late 80s early 90s and um if you want to be at wanted to be a school teacher and understand about you know getting your loves in order right and you know getting your highest good you know what the highest good should be and I listened to Timmy Holly talking to Jimmy Fields, who was in his class, but also on his basketball team. Uh, and you would have, if you would have been a fly on the wall back then in 19, maybe 89, 88, you would have realized, okay, I've just had in a concentrated way, the best of any professional development day I could have had. Hmm. You know, like all those, you know, they, you know, they bring in some good speakers for professional development, all that stuff. Five minutes of eavesdropping on Timmy Holly talking to a kid with professional development at its best. Wow. And uh, and there were some other folks, colleagues, you know, certainly Mr. Daniels was certainly that, you know, Mr. Bristow, Louise Miller, um, who I shared an office with, too, who sadly passed away in 2008. But she was our JV basketball scoring scorer, did it voluntarily just because she wanted to be with it. Before a championship game in 1996, JV game, place was packed playing BL. I had jury duty that day. I had to come back on the bus to make sure I didn't miss getting the red kids. I had to put the net up in the old gym because uh, Luke and because Ray Mills, who I'm sure, you know, wonderful man over there in the cage. And mm -hmm. uh, so he helped me. I climbed up on a ladder and I put the net up. The kids were waiting for me in the locker room and BL's down in the locker room and Louise walks into the gym and she says, do you want to play horse? <laughs> no one you know i don't know if you you know i know you're a lacrosse player and stuff in soccer right but i mean no one says no to a horse invitation no. i don't care what no ever. way you know <laughs> so mrs miller and i played horse before i went down to talk to the kids before the jv championship game in 1996 and and she beat me and she was really good she was left-handed so it was a little bit of rocky balboa stuff going on there and um, but so, and she was the dearest colleague because you, um, you could ask her questions. I, because I didn't know, understand anything for the most part. And I said, so, Hey, Louise, is this a predicate? Like what part of speech is this? Let me take a look, bring it here. Let me take a look. And she'd say, well, I think it's this. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I think even though she absolutely knew and she wasn't being patronizing, she just realized that we're all on this journey of trying to figure it out. And so I had so many, but yet yeah, 10 minutes outside a closed door with Timmy Holly talking to kids and you would have had a pretty good glimpse of what you're shooting for. Mm. So. So I, I know one of your commonly used phrases is Dante is everywhere. And yeah. I'm curious, and I'm sure other people are curious, what do you mean by that? And where is Dante? Where, where can you see him? Where can you find him? Um, you know, and again, not being, not sounding like a smart aleck where you find, you find him everywhere. <laughs> um, and, and what that means is, you know, it's kind of like, you know, and it'll be true because you'll be driving an electric car sometime sooner than you probably think. Right. I mean, they're going to become the thing. You know, you buy a new car and all of a sudden you're driving on the beltway and now you bought a blue Nissan and all of a sudden and now the only car you see on the road are blue Nissan, right? And 
So what I learned really early on in the Dante class is once I was hanging out with Dante in a focused way by trying to read carefully and thoughtfully and going to these Dante meetings and stuff and sitting in the back of the room with my Gilman basketball shirt on, trying not to applaud at the wrong time, you know, in Boston with these Dante real scholar scholars. And, you know, none of those folks at those meetings were Proctor and study hall or trying to get kids to take charges, you know what I mean? In the lane. And, uh, but they're, you know, wonderful folks. And I started noticing that there were references to Dante often in contemporary literature. And so I sort of had the, my third eye open when I was reading a book to see if there would be any reference to Dante. And so give you a couple of examples. You know, Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, mm -hmm. right? T.S. Eliot's poem has a quotation at the beginning uh, from Dante's Inferno at the beginning of that poem. So oh, that's kind of cool. Cause I love epigraphs, right? You know, uh, Lawyers, I suppose, were children once, right at the beginning of To Kill a Mockingbird. And I love those tone setting quotations at the beginning of books. So then I, I read um, Snow Falling on Cedars by David Gutcherson, which is a wonderful, powerful novel about uh, Japanese internment camps. Quotation from Dante's Inferno is a quotation at the beginning. Um, and All the King's Men, um, quotation from Dante's Purgatorio. Is there? I thought, okay, somebody knows something here. Then I came across on a novel by the piano tuner, quotation from Dante. And so then I started keeping a folder of Dante's everywhere. And then when I mentioned that in class, kids would, you know, they'd read an essay or something or point out that the color of green is Dante's color of hope. And then some kid would read The Great Gatsby, right? And notice the power of green, you know, at the end. And so all of a sudden, I started noticing, I even came across a thousand years ago, and then recently, a, quote, a little mini paragraph in Dickens's A Tale of Two Cities, that literally is a mini, like, freeze-dried fruit, right? A little concentrated fruit kind of thing. A little mini paragraph that captures Dante's cosmology uh, about the fallen latitudes and the... Um, for the love of a woman and stuff. There's all kinds of Beatrice and cosmology stuff. So, uh, you know, once you, and it'll happen to you now. I mean, we've had, got a chance to chat a little bit and this has been really nice. So thanks for inviting me that you will stumble upon a Dante reference. And you know, if I had any money, I'd bet you a buck. Um, and I don't, so I won't. Um, <laughs> and I can't bet, bet, you know, bet you a Bitcoin because those aren't worth anything. It turns out, <laughs> you know, uh, but um you're going to stumble across a Dante reference in something you read in the next two weeks. Hmm. It's going to happen. Now I could be wrong, obviously, because I've been wrong, you know, a hundred times before lunch today, but um, you'll be surprised. Don't be surprised if you don't hear Dante referred to on um, criminal minds, you know, the TV show or something like, I mean, he just, he has been the Western world springboard upon which lots of people have jumped really high. I need to, uh, first I need to read the entire divine comedy. And for someone who hasn't read the entire thing, what would you, what advice would you give to someone like me? I only read Inferno in high school. Like if I wanted to read everything, read the entire comedy, what, what would you say to someone looking to, to do that on their own? Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. Number, number one, uh, read it like you're reading a novel. Uh, and so don't treat it as, because, you know, whenever you even hear this phrase epic poem, it's pretty easy to be daunted by that fact. And because that's a daunting phrase, epic, you know, it has this grandiosity to it, right? But you read it as a novel and um, used to tell the kids that the reason we don't read Cliff Notes is that reading Cliff Notes is like going to Bush Gardens and thinking you've been to Europe. You know, it's Virginia. It's not the real thing. So um, I'd rather you be confused by the real thing than think you understand the real thing because you've read a secondary source, right? So um, get Alan Mandelbaum has a great translation of Dante. And we did a phone interview with him back in 1992, and he was terrific. Um, and it's fairly inexpensive. It's a bantam paperback. 
Uh, got some really good illustrations in it by Barry Mosier. The notes are not daunting. The notes are helpful. If you get the parts you don't understand, keep reading. Because if we had to understand everything we read before we kept going, we wouldn't finish anything, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, I don't understand it. Okay, keep going. You know, just, you know, just like they tell musical performers, right? You make a mistake, keep playing. Mm -hmm. Think about how many times you've said that to your players in the three years you've coached. You know, X's and O's, throw that stuff out the window. What do you say 10,000 times a season? Keep playing. Don't worry about the Sign scoreboard. Don't worry about the What's score. That? Don't worry about the scoreboard. Just keep going. You Finish signed the up game. to play. Exactly. You signed up to play. You didn't sign up to win. Uh, so play, and um, just play. So on some level, the same thing. Just read. Keep reading. And um, and you used a, a, a perfect verb, Jake, too. That um, that you said. You know, I need to read Dante's Divine Comedy, uh, and. Uh, they're one of my favorite lines of all time. Have you ever seen the film Il Postino? I have not, no. All right, put it on your list. It's a wonderful, <laughs> it's a wonderful, wonderful film, you know, with captions. And it's about Pablo Neruda, the, the Chilean uh, poet. Yep. And uh, there's a great line in there that says, because this postman, you know, falls in love with a woman named Beatrice. No surprise, Dante is everywhere. Uh, but um, the line in the in the film is poetry doesn't belong to the person who wrote it. Poetry belongs to the person who needs it. And uh, I love it because, I mean, I, you know, I'm parched for words, right? I mean, I'm pretty hungry for words because I know that, I mean, even God, right, in the Jewish tradition, God created with language, right, in the book of Genesis, right? He didn't go to Target and get a creation kit. He said, let there be light, and so it was. Mm. Um, so... Read it. Let the notes help you when you are gu guided. And if you are confused at the end of it, um, just like you do with your teams and your classes, you know, Sam Keen's great line, you know, he has a poem at the beginning of beginnings without end that goes like this. A year before the outward events that changed my life, I had a dream. A man walked into my room. He was strong and beautiful, a seasoned man who'd fought many battles in the dark jungles of the world. He came over, sat on the edge of my bed and said, I've learned one important thing in my life, how to begin again. Mm -hmm. So in that spirit, dive headfirst into Dante or whatever that, you know, is calling you. And then what, what does Reap Cheap say in Lewis's The Voyage of the Dawn Treader? Swim. And if you start to sink, point your nose to the sunrise. <laughs> you know and it. so and therefore that takes the pressure off you're not going to understand all i have a friend who teaches da who taught dante and, and who's a buddhist taught dante in arkansas and he says when i told him there's so many books to read i'm really overwhelmed and he said dan in his great southern accent all you can really do is read well the thing you're reading at the time that you're reading it yep yep okay pressure's off let's go page one yeah well, I have that issue. I have too many library books checked out at once, and then I end up not not reading any of them because I have too many too many going on. So I I totally agree with that advice. Yep, I completely do too. It's just really just <laughs> you know just re, you know read well the thing you're reading. What's that line? I want to be well read. No, I want to learn to be read well. Mm -hmm. That might be a better way to swap to switch that phrase around. So, so Dan, another question I had is, and you and you just really demonstrated this is something that you did in your class was ask your ask your students to memorize Dante and that's something that when I was in college one of my professors in a Shakespeare course asked all of us to memorize Shakespeare and then recite it in front of our sections in front of our class and at the time I think I was a freshman maybe a sophomore I was like this is dumb like why why do I have to spend all this time memorizing Shakespeare you know, and I think a lot of people probably think that way. Why do I have to, why do I have to memorize this? I could just look it up. I can just have it in a book or, you know, look it on, look up it on my phone. And something that I've been doing in my classes at Gilman is asking my students to, to memorize some poetry because I've found that it's really important to do, to have that accessible in your mind because everything today is, you know, you can look everything up and, and it just takes, a lot away from the art 
And I wanted to ask you why you put so much emphasis in your classes on having your students memorize Dante and recite Dante. Um, well, number one, I think it's, a, I mean, it, I mean, well done. I think it's a good, I think it's a, a good exercise that you're having the, having the kids to do. And when I had them, they had to memorize a tear sit a day, three lines, and then um, one kid um, every, uh, and it's true if, if with the ninth graders too, but with the seniors, certainly one um, day you would be assigned, it would rotate. This student would be responsible to memorize six lines and then recite it out loud in class and then explain why those six lines mattered to them. And, um, you know, and, uh, you know, the kid, the, as you probably certainly learned, I mean, the, the Gilman students and, and certainly the tri school kids, I mean, on some level, I mean, they get assessed to death. You know, I mean, they get graded and graded and they're, they get very worried, obviously, about grades and, you know, grades certainly matter, but they tend to take on a life of their own for a lot of their kids and they become, they become almost like Dickensian children, you know, they're 17, but they look like they're 45 because they've been stressed out by numbers so much. But so I didn't really grade them. I said, listen, okay, do it and then check yourself and see how you did and then do it. And, you know, kind of put the, put the honor piece back in, not just fear of getting caught, but in how they want to live their honest lives kind of thing. And I heard, I, back in 2002, I heard a, a show on All Things Considered uh, with uh, uh, Melissa Block was interviewing a guy named Mark Moskowitz. And Mark Moskowitz um, did this film called Stone Reader, documentary about, he had read a review of a book in the New York Times in 1972 that was supposed to be a book, great book of his generation, started it, hated it, put it down for 25 years, and then picked it up in 1998, couldn't put it down. And he wanted to read other books by this guy and he couldn't find this guy anywhere, a guy named Dow, D-O-W, Dow Mossman. So he, he did this film, The Search for Dow Mossman. It's called Stone Reader. And I heard the show and I thought it was kind of neat. Independent film, what, maybe seven people around the world went to see it. Um, it was playing at the Avalon Theater in May that year. And I happened to be down at Politics and Prose down in D.C., a bookstore has a great cafe down at the bottom. And I went and I heard, so I went to the, see the film. Me, Saturday night, Life in the Fast Lane. I go to his film and there are maybe eight people in the theater <laughs> and Dow Mossman in the film says the following line to Mark Moskowitz. He says, listen, you know, you're a certain kind of reader, you know, a special kind of reader, but he says, listen, the process is now in you. As long as my book is somewhat alive in you, I couldn't ask for anything more. The process is now in you. So that's the author telling the reader that my book is alive in you. So I literally got back in my car, I'm driving up 95, and I realized I just had a burning bush moment, I should have taken my shoes off. <laughs> and um, because that was, that Holden Caulfield is no longer the protagonist of a novel. He is my wounded brother, our wounded brother. He lives in us, right? These books live in us. It's almost Eucharistic, right? It's like, instead of take and eat for this is my body, it's like take and read for this is my body, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, yep. and so I came back to school, wrote to Mark Moskowitz, who did the film, invited him to school. And um, he came and did a long assembly with the kids and then spent the day talking to the Gilman boys. And then the ninth graders final exam until my final ninth grade year was their exam was on that film because books are alive. And so the idea of memorizing things, which you're having your kids do, why? Because at crunch time, um, and we're always, we're all of us are going to face crunch moments in our lives. I wanted to have a repository of language that I could rely on if my own language didn't suffice. So if I could tap into, and I could have, you know, percolating inside my veins, if I could have the language of Shakespeare, if I could have the language of Dante or Charles Dickens, if I could have some of it that I could tap into when I needed to be reminded that the journey is worthwhile, 
I would have it at my disposal. Hmm. So it was kind of like giving the, you know, the kids a, a reserve tank for when they, um, to remind them they weren't alone. And if they felt alone, they could tap into that bank account uh, and they could, oh yeah, uh, what's that one I remember? I don't remember the whole sonnet, but the one by Keats, when I have fears that I may cease to be before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain. Okay, I got that in me now. <laughs> and so when I get frightened that, you know, if I got sick or something, you know, uh, I had a kid one time, Johnny Guff. I taught junior English, 1987. And I gave the kids an assignment. If Mr. Keats came in the room and said to you, hey, you guys, how are you? Fine, Mr. Keats, how are you? Well, you know, I'm having these fears that I may cease to be before my pen has teamed my, you know, <laughs> gleaned my teeming brain, you know, and I gave them a 20 minute exercise. What would you tell Mr. Keats? So our kids are, you know, writing really hard for 20 minutes. Johnny Guff was done in less than a minute. So I went up to him and I said, so Johnny, are you? Yeah, Mr. Christian, I'm done. Okay. So, all right. You know, I, you know, I'm not gonna, you know, you're gonna pick your battles, right? I'm not gonna argue with you. And so I said, well, so Johnny, after 20 minutes, would you be willing to read what you would say to Mr. Keats if he came in? Sure. <laughs> it was precious. I mean, it was just like crazy. I said, okay, good. He said, dear Mr. Keats, if I were you, sir, I would take out a piece of paper and a pen and I'd start writing as fast as I could. Oh, wow. Your friend, Johnny Guff. Wow. And that's pretty wise, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, what am I going to do with the fears that I'm not going to be able to do everything I need to do before I die? Well, I think I'm going to put my shoes on and I'm going to the library. Or I'm going to the golf course. I'm going to deliver food for the food pantry, which I met some nice people here that I get to do three times a week here. I mean, instead of fussing about though giving those peer fears power i'm going to claim my own authority isn't it cool that authority is mostly the word author mm. you know so seize the day seize the day carpe so, diem yeah and, and 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 not just you don't have to jump on the desk and be robin williams either and start tearing out pages and books right uh yeah you can literally seize it and claim it as your own because it is your own mm-hmm you know, what, what is uh, Scrooge learns at the beginning of uh, after he wakes up on Christmas morning, he realizes that the bedpost was his own, uh, the room was his own, but most importantly, the time before him was his own to make amends in. Hmm. Man, I mean, I you know, I, yeah, I'm in. I want to I want to be a part of that club. And because I was lucky enough to have landed where I did, I got to join that pay attention to books club and I'm, and now I want to read, I got, you know, a lot, I'm, you know, so here I am. Do you talk with you about books? Do you read Dante every day? Do you read the, the divine comedy every day? You know, I don't, I've been, I reread it a couple of times this past year and I, I, I did something I'd never done in my life. Uh, we, we, I, I, I wanted to, and Cesare has a copy because he was instrumental in designing the cover. Um, you know, sort of published independently a book of Roland Park, Gilman, and Bryn Mawr students' essays on Dante um, because I wanted to, their voices to be out in the world in a bigger book. So we have a book that, and the proceeds go to the Chapins and to the Dante Society. And so once that finally got, you know, I was sort of a one-man band uh, editor, you know, like I edited all these 37 essays and it's now out there in the world and, and I'm very proud of it. Couldn't be more proud of it. But I decided to apply to, to write a paper on Dante and folk music and present it at this conference. Now, Mike, the chances of getting selected was, was like a hook shot with blindfolders on from three-quarter court, you know. But I was amazingly, I got to, to write a paper and present it by way of Zoom last September. So I got to, to work on that, you know, and I read Dante to prepare. And then I have some, an idea about Dante and folk music and some friends or Bob Ortiz and Pam Ortiz, who live in Chestertown, down on the Eastern Shore, yep. used to use their music a lot in class. So if I'm lucky enough to live long enough, I'd like to write an extended piece on how their music is like the soundtrack to the Dante film. You know, you know, when you listen to, you know, 
the music behind Titanic, right? I mean, so now, now let me ask you. I mean, I, let, let me ask you about that. How did you discover the pairing between folk music and Dante? When did that originate, and and how did that kind of play into your class? It started in 1986. I I did got to do because Gilman, you know, invites faculty, and I'm not a I'm pretty much of an introverted person. Uh, you know, I mean, you can be a public teacher and still be an introvert. You know, I'm not out there chit-chatting with people. But I offered an assembly on Harry Chapin in 19, uh, on Ju uh, January 10th, 1986. And I got to play the kids some Chapin music because Harry's, mu Harry's story songs, I came to realize, sort of knew me better than I knew myself. And just like when the first time I read Catcher in the Rye, I was convinced that Holden was going to pause and say, holy cow, Dan, I'm being rude. Let's talk about you for a while. You know, <laughs> and it was like that personal. And Harry's music has been like that. So then every four years when a new group of Gilman kids came, I got to offer a, another, hopefully more improved Harry Chapin assembly. And so I did that every four years from 86 until the final one in 2015. And yeah, uh, and then Harry Chapin's son spontaneously showed up at one in 1990, and then I invited Harry's daughter to come, and she did a Dante workshop in 2011, uh, which again, Harry, without Cesare and Steve Paquette, you know, they would not. They, so I just thought, okay, comedy. The etymology of the word comedy literally goes back to etymologically to goat song. So it's kind of like a piece of folk music. And then he divides it into cantos, which is cantare in Italian to sing. So it made sense that every good experience should be getting it in music with me. So I decided why well, I'd make it a part of our day one of our first class. And then I started, it took me a long time to get to this, but that they would um, listen to, I'd give them some music as their part of their final exam. And then their job was to listen to the music, take good marginalia notes, and then write for an hour, choose a song, and write for an hour why that particular song, Dante would have been listening to it in his earbuds after he had finished writing the poem, and that song would have helped him better appreciate the fact that both the journey and the writing journey was worth the effort. Mm -hmm. Explain why. And so um, it just gave me a way to number one it gave me a chance to force feed for folk music to children which they desperately needed uh, i thought and uh so since i got it was my class i got to tell them what they're going to do right so they're going to listen to this music and it, and then so many good things came out of that because you know the chapin stuff i got to go to some other schools and share harry with um and then the, um we did a, a, a got some kids performing the music live instead of tape music. And um, and again, we started doing that in 2002. We did a really big one and kids did some paintings of Harry, which you can see. Oh, wow. Uh, they did four of is. them and five foot by five foot canvases. And that painting along with, um, um, came back to me as a gift. We took him up to New York to a Chapin family concert and the paintings all sold uh, for a total of $5,000. And so we got wow. to make a donation to the Chapin folks of $2,500. And each kid got a, um, a check for 833 bucks. And then we got to make, give the rest of it to the, and then this one came back to me as a gift. So, That's uh, awesome. I mean, oh my God. Yeah. I mean, so Harry's <laughs> looking, he's looking over my shoulder, like, uh, um, he's been doing since 1972. And then there's a little John Denver, right. Right there, you can see John right there. That's so, awesome. so it became it, so it really was a natural um, um, complement to Dante's journey to have folk music be a part of the process. It seemed to me anyway. Um, so, so Dan, let me ask you um, another question about Dante, and I'm I'm curious. I, I think my response to so I have my own response to this question, but. Here's the question. If you were with Dante, if you got to meet Dante, what would you ask him? And I think my question that I'd love to hear your response to would be, is there a way to sidestep hell and purgatory and just go right to paradise 
after after we die, we can just go right to paradise and, and just sidestep all the ho- horrors of hell. What would you What would you ask him, and how might you answer that question? That that is that is a fabulous question. <laughs> and again, I mean, I you know, I mean, I if if you don't mind, I would I would first my response is to suggest to you, if you don't mind a suggestion, that you find a way to creatively repurpose that question to give that as a writing prompt to your students for other books and stuff, because that's a wonderfully, wonderfully interesting question for the kids to ponder um, and, and have them interact with the text in a very living way. Right. Cause then the person that they're meeting um, I mean, I, so I, that first, that your response to that, what you'd want to ask him, I think without putting any words in Dante's mouth because he's more than capable of speaking for himself and has, <laughs> thank goodness, 14,233 lines worth. I think Dante would respond to you by suggesting, hey, Jake, that's a great question. <laughs> Rather than me answering it, I think you should go and read Dietrich Bonhoeffer's The Cost of Discipleship. And what you would discover in Bonhoeffer, who was a Lutheran pastor who died on April 9th, 1945, three weeks before Hitler died, he got involved in the plot to assassinate Hitler. And he was really interesting, um, died at age 39, same age Harry Chapin died. Um, And he makes this really interesting distinction in the cost of discipleship that we have to distinguish between cheap and costly grace. And um, the journey to wholeness is, by its definition, a costly one. And there's no cheap, there's no cheapness. As, it's that old line, right? You know, certainly Christians, Christianity would probably argue this. Salvation's free, but it's not cheap. So you have to kind of earn, you have to earn the gift. And because otherwise, you're going to open that box, and you're not going to find anything but styrofoam seeds. And so I think he would suggest to you that you read Dietrich Bonhoeffer. For me, I think if I would ask him that question, I think he would tell me that... um, Harry Chapin in a really obscure song that was on a remake of his final album before he died. He says in a song called, I finally found it Beatrice, or excuse me, I finally found it Sandy. Um, he says that I, um, I only have one more bluff to call. Meaning he's learned so much from this relationship with his wife, but there's one more thing that's kind of a rock in my like psycho spiritual shoe. And if I, I think I would ask Dante if he could help me grapple better with something I have been grappling with all my life that I'm still struggling with at age 67. And I think he would say, listen, um, I'm, I'm with you here, brother. Um, and I, instead of me answering that question for you, let's go have a cup of tea at the bird in hand (laughs) or dash. And I think you and I should talk our way through because I don't have the answer to that question, but I hope my journey has been a source of light so that we can shine the light inside you, Dan, so that you can answer, find the response to that question for yourself. Love that conversation and thought and just more questions, but That's something that we talked a lot in my English 11 class this year is is light, is the idea of light. And I, I know that's 
huge symbol in all literature, but especially in, in Dante too. And I always ask my classes the question, what, like, why do you think Gilman's motto is all about oh. light? And how how that like why do you go to school and their philosophy is all about light, and it really shows up in a lot of the in the conversations that we have about the text that we read too. This idea of light, and we read The Road by Cormac McCarthy recently. And that's another you know that's part of that whole book is shining the light, carrying the fire, and and talking about that idea. Um, but I'm sure that's something that you've thought a lot about too in in Dante. Absolutely. I mean, the, the best line in Pam Ortiz used to play them in day one since 1991, a song at, on day one of the class called Angels. And the um, best line in that uh, in that song is um, you be on the lookout for someone bearing light and you'll find yourself an angel to walk you through the night. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's just a. Um, a great sort of image and, and to talk about conversation my college advisor at St. Ambrose Father Anthony Farrell um, he was um, after lunch one time I was chatting with him and he said to me the following thing that I never forgot but never understood until I got to hang out with Dante you know but again you know how it is you know, you know I wasn't ready but isn't it cool? The word ready is mostly the word read too, right? <laughs> so when Hamlet says the, re the, the readiness is all, he means when the, re the readiness is all, mm -hmm. I think. Um, but mm -hmm. he said to me, Daniel Eugene, that was all he always called me, either Daniel Eugene. He said, the, the history, the story of literature, the history of literature is a story of one grand conversation. And I never forgot it, didn't know what it meant. And then in 2007, when he got very ill with pancreatic, he was one of those teachers that was in my corner from 1972 until the day he died. And he was in my corner 10,000%, and I never did one thing to deserve it. You know, I mean, he just loved me to bits nonstop, like I was a son he never had kind of thing. And I flew to Madison, Wisconsin to, um, to essentially say goodbye to him. I had heard that he was ill, so I flew out there and then had to fly back to get back to basketball practice. Um, and we spent a couple hours talking, and he had a walker, and he wasn't very old. He was probably 64. So he walks me out to the car, and, uh, and he and I disagreed theologically on everything. He used to introduce me in, uh, in, in theology classes um, as, oh, yeah, this is, this is uh, Mr. Christian. He embodies in one person every Christian heresy in the last 2000 years. That's how he would invite it. So I would father, thank you so much. So, uh, but he was just in my corner and he walks me to my rental car in Madison, Wisconsin. And, uh, and he gives me a hug and then he pulls back and he says, Daniel, Eugene, remember grace is always in this very present moment. The last thing he said to me and, uh, and when I tried to call him about a month later to tell him I was going to use the, the, the one grand conversation line in a blurb for a course at Gilman, um, I found out that he had died. Um, but the last thing, uh, and lo and behold, he's buried in, at Gr in, the, in Grinnell, Iowa, which is 50 minutes west of here. And um, so, but that's what he said. Grace is in the, pre in the present moment. And History of literature is a story run grand conversation. So talking about light, that what we're doing now is we is a privileged thing. And I know that sounds sort of hokey, but we are because we get to participate in that conversation that started before we were born and is going to go on after we died. But here we are in this little unit of uh, you know, Jake Cesare and Dan time. <laughs> if we don't, I mean. It sounds like hokey, you know, or Hallmark cardish, but this is a privilege to talk yeah. books. You know, this is a gift. So definitely is Dan. It's been a lot of fun to talk to you. I'm so glad that my, my mom and sister ran into you in that coffee shop and crazy as that is, we've been trying to, trying to get you on here for a while now. And it's, it's definitely been a privilege and a lot of fun talking to you. I could, I have so many questions for you about Dante and about, 
Harry Chapin and your classes and what you did in there for, for so long here at Gilman. And I wish that I had more time in, in person with you to, to pick your brain more, but it's been an absolute pleasure today talking to you. So thank you so much. Well, it's been, it's been, it's been a real pleasure for me and, and I appreciate it. And you can certainly, if you ever have a Dante question, I don't have any answers, but I, you know, send me an email. I have replies. Uh, but you know, the nice thing is, and I can certainly tell without I hope this don't sound like pat patronizing, but from our conversations, also from what I heard, you know, my, the, my Gilman chapter, you know, I've been gone for two years and um, I've kind of closed that door, you know, I mean, I'm moving on to my next thing. That's a part of my life that I'm grateful for. And, uh, and, and Gilman's really lucky they have you uh, because you. Um, you have, it certainly sounds to me like you have your head, your passionate intellect, as Dorothy Sayers says about Dante, is grounded in in, in reading and books, you know, and, uh, and those things, those things are the currency by which we establish relationships with kids. So, uh, they, they, they stumbled, uh, they found gold when they found you and they found the highest of gold with Cesare Zaganti there. And I'm That's sure you're sure. very much aware of that. I mean, he <laughs> is, you know, he is, you know, uh, after, um, uh, Harriet Tubman's going to be on the $20 bill so after that, Cesare is going to be on the next um, piece of currency. <laughs> That's my, and I'm going to fight until that happens. So I'm with you um, there. hundred percent. Thank you, Jake. And you, you take good care of yourself and keep, uh, keep teaching them. I will. I will. Thank you so much, Dan. Right, sir. Thank you. See you, Cesare. Take care. Thanks. Have a good day. Bye-bye. You too.